Thank you. Well, now I've switched to the cosmological constant problem. <laughs> <laughs> I won't bore you. Um, okay, so, uh, you know, I was given the title of these lectures, uh, Vision for Particle Physics, comma, Strong Dynamics. So, with that sort of broad uh, statement, I need to sort of interpret what the goals are for these lectures. Um, and at least sort of give you the sense of the questions and the direction I'm coming at it, so that even if you don't get answers, uh, you can at least hopefully share the questions. Um, you know, around, for, for people of my vintage, around about the first few years after the millennium, um, something transformed in, 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 in the psychology. Um, Look, before that, we knew the LHC is coming, the Tevatron is there, and so on, you know, there, there are flavor tests being done, but there was still a sense among model builders that um, there were sort of a fixed set of rules for trying to come up with new ideas, and there was a little sense of a kind of a game about it. And as I say, just the first few years after 2000, at least for me, there was a psychological shift, because in the late Tevatron era and with an imminent LHC, you really felt that you had sort of put your fist right into this high temperature superconductor, which is the vacuum, right? Experimentally, we were there. And that somehow changed whether you were willing to speculate wildly or a lot, or whether you were really scared, look, there's a real stuff there, and, and I have to try and work with reality, as opposed to being a poet of reality, okay? Or alternate universes. Um, and it was also a kind of a scary thing. Uh, it still is scary because there's this real thing, there's only one of it, and you're trying to figure out what's there, and you're a little bit at the mercy of what's there, and the experiments are now. Um, but there's also some excitement that I think that kicked in there, and which I still have, which is that in a sense, the job of the theorist has become part of the collective mind of experiments, which is you've got a new substance, how do you intelligently probe it? If you, if you imagine this was a, instead of the vacuum being a superconductor on a cosmic scale, it was a superconductor in a lab, some new material, how would you probe it then? What kind of things would you do? Would you stick to sort of rigid dogma about what it was all about, or would you try different tests, different experiments in a very sort of anti-authoritarian way? Um, so in a sense, the question that I ask is, how can I mind meld with experimentalists who are very willing to listen to reason about what things to try and so on. Um, and so that's the frame of mind that I wanted to bring to uh, these lectures. Um, this, there's sort of a second wave of this that kicked in when the Higgs boson was discovered um, just recently, which is suddenly this feeling that something that was sort of an abstraction in the textbooks suddenly leapt into real life. And you might have said, yeah, but we knew it was gonna come, <laughs> but, but I didn't know. I didn't know uh, for sure, and then suddenly it's there and it seems to, you know, again, some of its properties are matching up with the textbook Higgs boson. But there was a second sense that this is really there. It's no longer sort of a purely theoretical game to be a theorist, that you really are part of the experimental effort. Um, okay, so that's the spirit of these lectures. Of course, there's just the basic fact that we have not seen anything beyond the standard model yet um, at the LHC or in fact, um, over a wide range of sort of particle physics experiments. Um, there's a question, you know, how complete have experiments been in, in, in giving us that, you know, dismal news? Um, and how complete are their plans for the future? Okay, we're gonna effectively have a new LHC within a couple of years, and where are we gonna be then? What are the plans? Are they fairly complete as a matter of sitting back as a theorist and waiting for the data to come in? Or do you have to actively participate in it? This is a needle in the haystack game, as you know by now. In looking for new physics, you wanna kind of set a template of what new physics you're looking for in order to have your best chances of optimizing. And there's a question of how best to make your gambles when you're doing a needle in the haystack search. How much time do you put, in, what's your sort of portfolio of risk? What different types of things are you trying? And even if there are searches that exist uh, for trying for some qualitative new type of physics, how hard should they try? Should, how hard should they pull out all the stops to improve their understanding of background, standard model background or, or not? How high in energy should they go or not? And I think you need some sort of a map to 
make those judgment calls, okay? So this is my best attempt to try and come up with my own map for myself based on mostly ideas from other people, but I'm trying to integrate them into sort of a map of, of, of possibilities. It's not meant to be an equal survey of all possible models or anything like that, but it is meant to be a kind of map with reasons for why I'm charting things out in certain ways and the risks that I assign to them and how I would want to proceed um, in, in what comes. Um, so the visions part of this talk is not meant to be a kind of a static set of, here are some paradigms, we worked them out long ago, and you know, you, you take them. Rather, I want you to think of them as sort of like chess stratagems or something. Things that you carry around in your head, you might invent your own, but as data comes, or as you're thinking about how to probe this new substance, right, the electroweak vacuum, um, you keep these ideas in mind, you can compose them in various ways and, and, and try and make sense of what to do, but you're not supposed to sort of worship them or pay them overly much respect, and yet you're not supposed to neglect them altogether either. I think these were, in some sense, great insights into what is possible. Um, so I think in this era, we're stuck between these two sets, okay, of what is observable and what is plausible, okay? What is plausible, we use theorists to try and figure out the sort of the body of ele elementary particle physics as we currently understand it, what can quantum field theory do, and observability, we have experimentalists and phenomenologists helping to figure out what new tricks colliders can do, what new colliders we could even have. And I think it's obvious to say that we should focus our attentions on this intersection, okay? Of course, nature might be more there than the, and, or there, but, but, but this is our best bet, the intersection of observability and plausibility. And, and, and you know, over time, these, uh, these two circles have sort of been moving apart. Um, so figuring out exactly what this best bet is, is getting more difficult. And so in the course of these lectures, you'll actually see me not focusing just here, but in fact wandering back and forth, um, trying to gauge where exactly to, you know, put our money down, okay, or really our time, our careers. Um, okay, so, so that's the structure that you'll see as you go through, and I hope you'll excuse, even though it's an LHC uh, set of uh, summer school, that there is some time spent in theoretical landscape and some, uh, some time in sort of just statements about experiments in general. Um, let me come to the second half of my title, which is strong dynamics. Um, strong dynamics, it's almost self-evident, is the blind spot of any vision of particle physics. And that's because strong dynamics is very difficult to compute, okay? Um, in a sense, you can say that a weakly coupled theory, what you write in the Lagrangian is what you get at the LHC or at a collider, okay? The particles you write down, the fields you write down correspond to particles, and, and the couplings are the things that directly give you an estimate of cross-sections even at tree level. Um, whereas in a strongly coupled theory, of course, uh, what you see in the Lagrangian is not what you get, okay? There's a huge reprocessing due to the strong interactions in terms of what ultimately comes out. Of course, the classic example is the strong nuclear force, QCD. You look at the innocent looking Lagrangian, pretty similar to QED, but what comes out is the entire nuclear world, okay? Um, when we're thinking about what is possible, we're envisioning what to expect, um, it's very difficult because we are, as humans, unable to easily cope with the intractable, intractability of calculating in a strongly coupled theory. And yet, we should accept that strong interactions already play an incredibly central role in our understanding of nature. If electrons are the, you know, the, the flesh and blood of uh, atomic physics, okay, give us life literally, then it's the nuclear physics that is providing the skeleton, okay, the nuclei. 
And so they're clearly playing, the richness of strong dynamics is clearly playing a profound role. And we want to ask, could it be playing a role beyond the standard model? Okay. And, uh, and, and, we're, and we're stuck by the fact that it could, it's a very exciting possibility, and yet our tools as theorists are, are few in number. Okay. Um, so often, again, you know, over the last 20 years or so, you sometimes see a kind of unfair debate going among physicists about the charms of Susie or the charms of weakly coupled theories versus the relative ugliness of strongly coupled theories. And in a sense, it's an unfair game because the weakly coupled theorist can stride confidently back and forth here and the strongly coupled theorist is sort of tripping over themselves and making a fool of themselves. And yet, nature may choose that course. The question is, how should we go about thinking about it, not insanely, how can we make good guesses, but not try for some sort of level of ultimate rigor that maybe will only be achieved, you know, long after the LHC is done? Um, so I want to give some ideas, some tools, some sort of systematic way of thinking about strong dynamics, um, and uh, fold that into this vision part, okay? Taking into account that a lot of the weakly coupled options are also being discussed um, in other lectures here. As far as the references are concerned, I, I was trying not to give references, but in the end, I'm going to give references because I think you can quickly learn the subject from a handful of sort of well-chosen references. Um, they're not meant to be fair in the sense I'm not giving you original references. That would take too much time for me to write down. So I'm going to give you references that I know, and hence some of the uh, unfair share will be to my own papers, which, however, have the seminal references in them. Okay, so this is uh, the only way I know to go about it quickly. Okay, so take these references as sort of reviews in their introductions of papers that you can then go read and see how the original ideas came about. Okay, so let's start. Um, so I want to first start about with, with just uh, recounting the puzzles that are already there in the standard model, which works incredibly well, of course. And while I'm at it, I might as well say the standard model plus general relativity, okay? The stuff that we clearly understand governs at least a very large part of our universe. Um, and I'm coming to it as if an alien from some parallel universe and just taking a glance. I don't have time to go into great detail. I just want to see what strikes the eye, okay? And, um, and so one of the things that strikes the eye is that some of the dimensionless couplings of the standard model namely the gauge couplings, say, we're normalized at the weak scale, and the self-coupling of the Higgs, say, we're normalized at the weak scale, are very crudely order one. What would have been a better guess? You're handed a Lagrangian with some dimensionless couplings, and they all turn out to be going rate order one, okay? So this is the first glance that we take there. And then we can compare this, however, with the other dimensionless couplings, um, the Yukawa couplings, where we see hierarchy, tremendous hierarchy. And dimly, we sense that there is a pattern. It's not quite a random set of numbers. It, there's some sort of a pattern that the eye picks out, okay? Um, so that's a striking contrast, and it's a puzzle, and the standard model certainly does not explain it. There's also a dimensionful, these are dimensionless hierarchies, there's also the obvious dimensionful hierarchy, which is just that the Fermi scale, the Fermi coupling, is much bigger than the gravitational coupling, or if you like, gravity is incredibly weak. Really, really, really weak, okay. Um, there is the fact that this, this, this theory actually does not govern the, the universe, even in the crude sense, because dark matter is missing from this description, and I'm not going to talk overly much about it, except to refer you to Neil Weiner's lectures. Um, but it is not part, fairly convincing case, that the, standard the dark matter is not made up of the standard model. Okay, so great for the Weiner lectures. 
Um, I'll add one more thing in that vein, which is that I probably won't have time to discuss my own thoughts on the subject, but the standard model does not help us understand this fact that the density, the cosmic density in baryons is even vaguely of order of magnitude the cosmic density of dark matter. And even more per perplexing that it is vaguely of order the dark energy. If, I, if I'm really doing great in time, which I doubt, I might discuss this a little bit. Um, in terms of what opportunities it might present at the weak scale, but this is definitely off the topic of discussion, not because it's not interesting, but because it's too interesting, okay, um, as Nima described. But some of the ideas that relate to how people have thought about this, I will try to incorporate into here. So I don't want to stick my head in the sand about anything. So only for lack of time, I'm not going to go into that in a big way. Um, and the last thing, I'd like to get it all on this board, so excuse me, but the last thing that we don't understand is we don't understand why this non-obvious but definitely there parameter of the standard model, the strong CP angle, is seen to be through electric dipole mo moment measurements in hadrons so much smaller than one, okay? Again, it could have been one, it's much smaller than one. Um, again, a very nice idea, and even alternatives to it are nice to think about, is uh, axions. You can read a little bit about it, and I think Mike Dine has some axion tassie lectures you can look at. But I'm not, I'm putting it in square brackets to say, I'm not, for lack of time, going to talk very much about this aspect of the story, okay? But in a broad brush, this is uh, the um, set of surprises or puzzles that the standard model presents us with. And um, now I want to sort of go at some of these things in slightly more detail, okay? Um, so let's start here, where I've just sort of summarized the data at this very zeroth order pass by saying they're order one couplings. And as Nima pointed out last time, um, we can look in detail at there's anything interesting happening with these gauge couplings. And I'm just talking about the standard model, nothing, nothing imaginary yet, okay? So just the standard model. And um, I wanted to, and of course, we can just study in the standard model, what is the renormalization group evolution of these couplings? We know that these couplings at MZ, they're derived quantities. In our reductionist way of thinking, these couplings originate from high energies. We're assuming that physics goes on to very high energies. And so we'd like to see not what these couplings are at MZ, but, but what's happening at high energies, okay? So um, I now want to just have a, uh, a slide come down. Um, just a little slide. So it's probably worth just looking at, again, no enhancement of the standard model or general relativity, um, and just looking at the strength of couplings measured as one over alpha, just to keep the renormalization group as simple as possible, for uh, strong SU2 and U1 uh, couplings. And, um, and while we're at it, why not throw in the strength of gravity where to, to draw this sort of as a one over alpha, I'm taking alpha for gravity. At gravity couples proportionately to Newton's constant, which is dimensionful, and the dimensions are made up by energy, okay, energy squared. So the alpha is, if you like, energy squared over, energy squared times G Newton. That's the dimensionless alpha. And uh, if you do that, then the strength of gravity looks like this crazy curve here. And um, so there it is. That's what current knowledge of the universe would say if you extrapolate to high energies. And you see that there's something interesting happening. It seems to be pretty well constant. This is a striking coincidence. If you hadn't seen the MSSM pictures when you were a baby, which would have inoculated you, then you should be struck by this, 
okay? Um, and so it is very striking, and the question is, coincidence, what does it mean, you know? The fact that things are happening somewhere around here. Now, if we could, oh, and of course, we should um, maybe in light of the pain of doing this, I'll do it in a slightly different order. Of course, we, we also have the MSSM version of the story, okay? Which is this perfect unification as far as gauge couplings are concerned. Gravity, not so much, but, but it's, a, it's a very striking picture, okay? Um, what does it mean? Okay, I guess we can raise the... Uh, So, there's a very simple and traditional reason why couplings should meet at all. Why does it look like the couplings are meeting in the standard model? We know that they, that why do they even nearly meet in the standard model? And why do they seem to perfectly meet in the MSSM? Well, the usual rationale, the traditional one, is grand unification. And I'll call this the sort of traditional traditional grand unification, um, any textbook, um, but you should also compare it with very plausibly um, other types of reasons why gauge couplings should come out equal at one particular scale, or even roughly equal at one particular scale. You might look at this uh, review, HEP pH, zero, two, one, two, um, describing alternatives, in particular orbifold unification, as another rationale. But I'll just go with this. I just want to keep in mind that it's not the only rationale for why couplings should come out equal. And that is that if you have a gauge group G and it breaks to some set of subgroups, okay, that if this is a unified gauge group, has a single gauge coupling just from its own non-abelian structure, then all of these couplings, one over GI square, if you want, just the GI of gauge group H, maybe I should do it like that, should equal G of G, okay? At least at the scale at which this Higgs mechanism kicks in, the grand unified theory is broken down, these couplings should be all the same. So there's a rationale. We have reasons why couplings, it's very significant when couplings all unite in that way. It's tipping off, off to something like this or equally exciting, but it's, it's interesting, okay? Um, and it seems that we in the standard model have something like that being hinted at between all the fundamental forces we're aware of. Not only that, we look at the, uh, the fermions, and in this kind of picture, say, of the traditional grand unification, fermions are very special because whatever fermions were there at, in the high energy theory at, at, at the scales where G is intact, chiral symmetries can protect them, and they can drift down to low energies, okay? In that sense, fermions are sort of uniquely qualified as a kind of fossil of grand unification because chiral symmetries can sort of retain their unified structure even though the gauge forces have broken apart. And indeed, we find that the standard model fermions that we are aware of right now, the standard model fermions fit beautifully into complete multiplets of simple grand unified gauge groups like SU5. So standard model in complete multiplets. Okay. There may be other reasons for that fact. Anomaly cancellation or something. But but it's a striking it's a striking piece of evidence in some way. Okay. Um, so as you saw, as I said, I switched the order a little bit, uh, the MSSM does a bang-on job for at least three of the forces unifying, 
and if you believe in supersymmetry for all the reasons we've heard about, then it seems like the kind of confirmation from God that you need, okay? Um, now in detail, it's easy for, it's easy for us theorists to draw the straight lines, but of course there's the two loop running and so on that's not being shown in any of those pictures. And um, so roughly you can look, for example, at the particle data group review on grand unification by Stuart Rabi. But, but basically, you need threshold corrections. You need some rationale for why the unification is not perfect, both in the MSSM and in the standard model. In the standard model, the kind of quantitative gauge of how bad that, look, how bad that thing looked is, uh, is it, well, so there are many ways to say it, as Nemo pointed out, but one quick way to say it is, you need threshold corrections at the gut scale, which are about contributing about 20% of the differential running that you're seeing in those lines, okay? So when you're looking at those lines, you're seeing some sort of differential running, different, different gradients for those lines. And in a sense, you need 20% of that differential running, you need something to fix up the gradients by about 20%. It's not bad, as I say, it is a shock already. But if you ask what is it in the MSSM, it's more like something, well, three to four percent. After you put in all the things that you know, you need some sort of unknown factor about thresholds at the sort of few percent level in order to get a perfect story, okay? So one of the reasons why strong dynamics is disfavored psychologically, one is it's just very hard to think about, so Let's think about something easier. But a very substantial reason is the, the contrast between those two slides. Um, often I have a feeling by looking at the sort of one loop story, but in a sense, if you look at the threshold corrections you need in the standard model to say that the standard model is correct all the way up to the grand unified scale, that's 20%. If you wanna say, the MSS, MSSM is correct, and that's the story that ultimately leads to grand unification. You need threshold corrections of 4%. So you can ask, how much are you willing to stake on that 4% versus 20% being your guide to what to expect during the course of your careers, okay? That the MSSM thing looks so good that you're willing to stake the house, the dog, the family, all on that. And I say, no, when you compare the sort of three to 4% with the standard model at 20% in terms of the required fudge factors to, to make the story of unification work, you can take a different moral, okay? And the different moral would be that the standard model shows us that something is up, okay? It's the data itself. And the emesis, and, 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 and it, if, any, if any theory was in, in a certain sense close to the standard model. It would be modifying the gradients in those lines by some small amount, and we just needed it to be the right, the right amount, okay? Um, the fact that the MSSM falls within exactly the right 4% is a, or 3%, is a kind of 10% coincidence in that sense, okay? Um, the standard model is already doing a lot of the work in getting us close to unification, and the MSSM touches it off. So, in a way, I would rather you play around with it, take a look at the two loop corrections, take a look at what is the typical going rate of a threshold correction in grand unification, and get a sense for yourself, because you are probably, in some implicit or explicit way, gambling on the marvels of MSSM unification at some level. Um, in terms of what you think might come out and what not to work on. You know, let's not work on anything which is not Susie, okay? Um, my own take is I put a lot of value on the MSSM unification plot, um, but other things are definitely possible, okay? So I don't, I don't gamble everything on it. Okay, so this is, this is my attempt to talk about these guys. I will attempt to talk about this a little later. Um, I wanna switch to talking about this in a little more detail. What is the pattern that the eye sees 
in, uh, when it looks at the data. Um, and I want to give a very crude, you know, if it was the bomber series, we would write down the pattern, we'd have many, many entries, and we would nail it, and then we'd all ask, what is the theory that just gives that very simple formula? It's not, it doesn't have many, many entries. Um, there is some sort of a pattern, and nobody has got some perfect fit. First, we haven't measured these things incredibly, incredibly well, and uh, the entries in the CKM matrix or the quark masses. And then on top of that, we, we, we just don't have some perfect, very algebraically simple thing to say. But nevertheless, I want to capture what I glean from this, uh, again, based on really other people's work. Um, and that is that there's an ansatz for capturing the data and the correlation that the eye sees in the crudest way. Not the most committed to one particular point of view way, but the crudest way, and it's this. That if you take the standard model, so this is imposing a little theory on it, because I'm giving you this ansatz. We don't measure every Yukawa entry, we only measure the CKM angles and the quark masses. Um, The standard model Yukawa matrix, the data is roughly compatible with what should have been true if it was like gauge couplings or something, that the Yukawa couplings are just matrices with order one entries. Okay, so that's not correct. That's what you might have guessed if you had come to this universe for the first time. Um, but multiplied by some small factors. And so let me just give them names. Okay. And, uh, and similarly, maybe I'll just put it here, for the down type, looks like this, where these nine epsilons, the lefts, the ups, and the downs, these nine epsilons uh, and three generations, right? Um, are all, they can be complex, but they're all hierarchical between zero and one, okay? So we see something which is very hierarchical, and by definition of first, second, and third generation, the, 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 the one entry, the epsilon ones, the epsilon ones are smaller than the epsilon twos or smaller than the epsilon threes, okay? So I claim if you play around with it, which you should, you can, you might say it's a pain in the neck. These are three by three matrices. I have to figure out what the spectrum looks like and what the CKM angles look like. Well, you can do perturbation theory in epsilon, okay? So go, go ahead and, um, and if you just nail the fact that the, that the top Yukawa is about one, and we'll be a little less sloppy later, but this would suggest that the biggest of the epsilons are actually sort of saturating being of order one. Okay. Then, in fact, you can use the data to solve for all the epsilons. Okay. So, For example, the CKM you can confirm in epsilon perturbation theory. Um, the CKMs for entry i less than or equal to j or for entry j greater than or equal to i. Um, the, these, go, these are order epsilon i. These only depend on the left epsilons. Okay, um, and you can work out some of the other, for example, epsilon one, Q left, has to be roughly theta kabibo cubed, and epsilon two Q, just numerically, has to be roughly theta kabibo. You're looking at a kind of Wolfenstein parameterization of the CKM matrix, things like that. You can work out, I won't do all of them, you could work out, for example, 
that epsilon two of up type uh, is given by m charm over m top. So you can get them all by, so you can try and reproduce all this. Um, you can get them all by just the data we have on the quark masses, the going rate for the quark masses, and for the CKM entries, okay? And all the phases here can be thought of as order one, so that the standard model CP violating phase is also order one, which is what we observe. Um, when it comes to neutrinos, oh sorry, when it comes to leptons, we of course see the hierarchical charged leptons. And the neutrino data, again, the crudest pass through this, um, is roughly that all the neutrino masses and mixing angles are vaguely consistent with being anarchic, random numbers, except that the masses are all really tiny, okay? But no particularly large hierarchies. You can sort of see um, an analysis of this idea that neutrinos seem to be roughly anarchic in HEP pH uh, in, in this old paper. And even after measuring theta 1, 3 recently, uh, that picture more or less holds up at first pass, okay? Now, it's useful to have some characterization of the data of flavor because when we come to the LHC era, which you might say, gosh, I don't really, you know, flavor is a sideshow. But actually, CP violation and flavor violation are, are really the elephant in the room. Um, in a sense, if you don't understand these things or if these things go the wrong way, they undercut any attempt to see new physics at the LHC. And that's because these, these experiments probe by virtual sensitivity, by the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, if you like, they are probing energies vastly higher than the LHC reach, even higher than some futuristic 100 TeV collider, okay? So what you don't know could hurt you, so we have to know something about it, and we have to know some way of gambling about it, and I want to at least present some way of thinking, okay? And in that sense, it's at least useful to recount how did flavor violation meaning this is not a diagonal matrix, how did flavor violation show up in the one piece of data we already have, namely in the standard model? Okay, um, okay so just to illustrate that, we can imagine some new physics. Here I've drawn it as some propagator. And new physics, of course, can couple to the standard model, maybe to standard model fermions. So the classic case is some of the lighter quarks, okay? And we might imagine that it would be nice if the couplings to the standard model were order one. That would be great. You might hope to produce something like this, time running this way at the LHC with some light quarks banging into each other and in the, inside the protons and, and giving you the new, new physics as a resonance. So you can take a picture like this and in detail, let's see what the problem is. Uh, so the problem is in flavor violation, okay? And um, Namely that, again, time running this way, we can think of these things as producing effects inside kaons, which are made of these quarks. And here's QCD dressing it up and giving me a KK bar. So we can have the so-called famous flavor changing neutral currents um, where you could have KK bar mixing, but now coming from beyond the standard model, not just within the standard model. It's incredibly important because it's a unique window of the standard model. Flavor changing neutral currents are suppressed in the standard model because of the gym mechanism. Of course, they, they can take place, and they do take place through W exchange, right? But they're highly suppressed. And so the standard model background, if you like, is small, and we are very, very sensitive to this. And if these are sort of order one, 
flavor-dependent couplings of, the of new physics, then this kind of thing, if you look at CP violating, flavor violating constraints on this, you find that the mass of the new physics would be constrained to be you know, bigger than about 10 to the fifth, not GeV, TeV. Okay, so that kind of physics we're not gonna get to anytime soon. Okay. Um, so we have to keep something about flavor in mind the entire time we're guessing what we can do at the intersection of observability and plausibility. Having a nice coupling like this might be very observable, but it's rather implausible, generically, okay? Um, you can again look at, there are good TASI lectures on flavor physics that you can look at that review a lot of the different things. The flavor program is incredibly extensive. Using sort of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, it's been shooting bullets into the roof above the LHC roof uh, for a long time and no blood has been dripping down. Okay, so it's a, um, so we gotta worry for that reason. Is it special to evade these tests? Is it very, very special, very contrived, very unlikely, or is there, are there easy ways through it? It's a kind of filter for thinking about new physics. It's very powerful as a filter, as I'll try to show. Okay. Similarly, you can affect even flavored diagonal couplings. Even if the new physics is somehow just don't, don't be flavor non-diagonal, couple, couple to D bar D or something. Even that can be deadly because of CP violation. Again, tightly constrained within the standard model um, because of that very special structure. Again, ultimately a kind of gym, gym mecha mechanism. Um, for example, a picture like this with order one couplings, say between electron, say it's some sort of a scalar, okay? Um, this, these electrons could be sitting inside some atom with some other electrons. These quarks could be sitting inside some nuclei, inside some big nucleus. In fact, maybe this whole thing is a picture of, hmm, how about thallium? Just to choose the worst kind of thing. And if these are order one and CP violating, then they contribute to the dipole moment, the anomalous dipole moments, uh, electric dipole moments of atoms. So we do these tests as well, and these tests are still ramping up in terms of their uh, reach. Um, and even though this propagator, this, this propagator here goes like one over mass squared. And so if this mass is big, it's highly suppressed, life looks good. But nevertheless, the bound with this sort of random choice of couplings is, is, is still bigger than a thousand TeV, okay? Again, just, just as a paper to look at, you can look at some of the discussion on new physics and EDMs um, here. Um, so, the conclusion, um, here, I'll erase something. Mm -hmm. The conclusion is easy to state, that you must have some sort of a view of flavor as a filter for any of your ideas going forward and how they can constrain you. Um, now, just as a kind of interlude, you might ask, of course, well, this may be already preaching to those converted, but, but just in case, you might wonder, are people taking every new physics model and doing some sort of modeling how it affects a compli complicated atom and then working out the constraints on that model? And of course, that's not what they're doing. They're not looking at the explicit model and figuring it out. They are instead making intelligent use of effective field theory. So let me just do the quick infomercial. Um, in a sense, 
I find that most people know that effective field theory exists by now, it's constantly mentioned. And the only thing that varies is sort of the degree to which you put all your weight on it whenever possible and when sometimes you don't, okay? But only to say that effective field theory is very useful, especially when contemplating the unknown. Many possibilities in far UV turn into one thing, one set of possibilities in effective field theory as pertains to low energy experiments, by which I mean the LHC compared to the Planck scale, okay? So don't test all these models model by model. Instead, we just use the fact that just like, just like in the standard model, W exchange is very usefully given by the four Fermi theory at low energies, right? This kind of new physics exchange can be turned into some sort of, when the propagator has P squared minus M squared, at very low energies, I can drop this and it looks just like the, the Feynman rule for a contact interaction, some G new physics. So it sits inside some sort of effective Lagrangian. It's a higher dimension operator, so it's a four fermion operator in this case. And it characterizes some sort of new physics that I might have integrated out. Many types Many types of new physics models will reduce to the same effective operator. And so the amount of work you do in testing all these models is, is reduced by a factor of infinity by testing the effective operators. So you have gotta start to learn as you move forward into the unknown that your best friend is this effective standard model which is equal to the renormalizable standard model, which is a theory that you would want to stand alone, untouched by anything else. But if there's new physics and you integrate it out, in this sense, you will end up with higher dimension operators. And so the entire flavor program electric dipole moment program, precision test program, electroweak precision test program, is all phrased when it is at its best in terms of testing higher dimension operators of the standard model. And so it's important to have looked and even tried to write down for yourself what you would consider to be the important set of higher dimension operators in the standard model and to have looked in my view, a quick pass. I know nothing about beyond the standard model. I just walk in and I say, okay, I've got to think about higher dimension operators and precision tests. Um, at first sight, I'd say any of these things are sort of plausible that you could have new physics showing up as higher dimension operators divided by powers of the new physics scale, making up dimensional analysis to some power. And then I would ask, which of these are uniquely observable? How big do these coefficients have to be? One, right? How big do these coefficients have to be before they're observable? And in which kind of experiment are they observable? Is it a flavor test? Is it an electroweak test? Is it an EDM test? Um, and so on. Are they lepton tests? Are they hadron tests? But the more you have a sense for these higher dimensional operators, it's very hard to put your arms all around all the things that can happen beyond the standard model and get an instinct for it. It is a finite task done over time, so that it's not too boring, to accumulate an instinct for higher dimension operators and give them teeth in your instinct by relating them to the experiments, the type of experiments that are sensitive to those, those effects, okay? Um, this is, you know, non-renormalizable effective field theory in this way is not just as trivial as this at tree level, that hey, just drop the P squared, boom. Um, there's all the dressing at loop level that can happen within the standard model. And so this idea of sort of matching new physics to 
a effective Lagrangian and then running that Lagrangian and so on. This is a very crucial skill. Um, for many reasons, for many reasons, I like this book, which is, still, which is now a little bit old, but it's, but it's on George I's website. So on George I's website, there's his Weak Interactions book. And uh, I, I, I like it because A, it's compact and my patience is limited. Um, B, it is both a book about the standard model in all its different magnificent guises, but it's half of the book is secretly about how to think like a physicist. And uh, that's what makes it interesting, okay? So, so I recommend this. I'm gonna mention this book again as a place to start for a number of things, but but certainly for this kind of way of thinking. He's only doing the standard model, but even in the standard model, effective field theory is incredibly useful. And so I would say, take a look at it. It's on his website, and I guess in, par in some partial way is updated, even though it was written some time ago. But of course, the standard model is still doing pretty well, so a lot of what he has to say is still doing pretty well. Um, but it's the ways of thinking that I think are more important than the information itself, okay? Um, so, let me just go to here. Um, so the idea is in energies that um, we have already in the standard model, it's incredibly useful to say here's the weak scale and there are all sorts of interesting guys out there, Higgs, W, Z. And then here's the GV scale, and everybody else is here in the standard model. And it's an incredibly useful thing that's used routinely to use an effective field theory of just, so this is the L effective of the light standard model fields by integrating out or removing all these particles from the theory and, and, and running the theory down to low energy scales where you do all of your flavor tests and so on within the standard model. Um, however, if there's new physics, let's, let's just posit that the new physics is in some sense a little bigger than the weak scale. You can modify this picture any way you want. Um, so there are some new states out here the idea is to have an effective, uh, an effective uh, theory of the entire standard model, including all of these fields, with higher dimension operators, which in your mind's eye come from taking these propagators and recognizing that the, the, the momentum term can be dropped, if you want to say it in that way, okay? Um, and again, there, the reviews in TASI are good. There's the Skibas review on, uh, on using this kind of thinking in electroweak tests, and uh, Gedalia and Perez in the TASI reviews on flavor. And it's all couched in this language that you need to make your own, okay? Okay, so flavor is a problem. We gotta think carefully about flavor, or we're only maybe getting half the picture of what's possible, okay? Um, so, there's a, so it's useful to have, even if you reject it in the, in the end, it's useful to have the kind of number one cartoon, which you, can, which you can make as detailed as you want, but the number one cartoon of how flavor, where the funny pattern of the Yukawa hierarchy came from, what gave rise to it. It has to be outside the standard model, so what, what gave rise to that uh, hierarchy? Um, and I say it's the number one cartoon because in a sense, there are a variety of ideas for the origins of flavor structure, and at a kind of take off your glasses level, um, they all can be captured by this one uh, paradigm for flavor, uh, for flavor origins. And furthermore, it's a highly pictorial one, and so, gosh, we should learn that, okay? Um, and that is to th that, that, that the origins of flavor may well come from higher dimensions of space-time. Okay, so it's also exciting because it has that aspect to it. Um, 
And as I say, it makes it very pictorial. Um, so I'm actually pushing the discussion in a particular direction, ultimately make contact with my other topic, strong dynamics, and, and the one reference which contains the other references that you want to look at, namely the original ones, uh, is contained in a paper of myself and several collaborators, um, HEP PH, and I think, okay, so I mean this and really the references inside, um, uh, which I think I put on the reading list already, okay? Um, and indeed, the origins of thinking of flavor and as related to uh, higher dimensions goes all the way back to the early days of string theory, but, but certainly Nima and collaborators made it something uh, very flexible uh, in, in, our, in our thinking, okay? Um, so, Let's go at it. This is, think of this as an infomercial. I don't want to spend arbitrarily amount, large amounts of time talking about extra dimensions at all, but uh, just something to get us started because we have to think about flavor, right? There's no option. Um, so, of course, extra dimensions. You can think of extra dimensions as a grand generalization of a waveguide where the long dimensions our three-dimensional space, and if you're a space-time person, space-time, those are the long dimensions, and the cross-section of the waveguide is uh, XD, which a former student of mine told me means extra dimensions, and that's it. Okay, so this is the picture, and if this wavelength is very small, then you will not resolve the extra dimensions because you don't have the wavelength small enough, ultraviolet enough to probe it. So the extra dimensions are hidden. And what's interesting is that the different quantum fields have to, in some way, propagate up and down the waveguide. And there are different modes in the waveguide. For example, one particle might have this mode and another might have uh, this mode, etc. okay? So there are different possibilities for how things look in this waveguide. Um, and we would guess that the, there might be all sorts of boundary conditions on this waveguide. We would guess that the standard model, the things that we identify as standard model fields are the least are the least wiggly. No, they're not this. Why? Because if you wiggle a lot, it costs you energy, and we are paupers in energy, um, right? So if this is happening at some incredibly short distances, the least wiggly guy is likely to be you, okay? Um, so that's it. That's, that's what I want to point to. And then to say, so I'm going to take such a cross-section. It might have really any funny shape. There it is. There's that cross-section of the extra dimensions. Um, okay. And in the vertical direction, I'm plotting the, I've kind of made, I've conflated the two somehow here, but but, but here I'm plotting the extra dimensional component of the wave function. We're solving wave functions for fields, and if we do separation of variables, there is some part of the wave function which talks about what the field looks like in the extra dimensional space. Um, and every standard model field, a priori, might have its own personal wave function. Um, so let me just draw something and then try to justify it. Uh, for example, the Higgs boson might have a wave function that looks like this um, in some way like that. Uh, or the, uh, you know, some random particle in the, f in the 
in the third generation or the first generation, say, might, might have that. There might be some new physics particle that uh, we don't know about that um, has some profile that looks like that, okay? And, um, and so on, right? So there are all these wave functions which are rigid if you're thinking of them, if you don't put in a lot of energy, they're, they're sort of rigid, the lowest lying of these modes that correspond to the standard model and maybe some other particles we're imminently about to discover. Um, now, why, would I, why am I pointing to this mountainous kind of picture? Um, So you might ask, well, what is the wave equation in higher dimensions? Well, it's something like the Klein-Gordon equation. Okay, well, so it's a Klein-Gordon operator. It's got the usual zero, one, two, three, and then it's got some extra dimensional components, and this is it, and then, the picture I'm drawing here is that you satisfy the Klein-Gordon equation, except when you don't. And the, but, but I'm positing that there are some localized sources, some special points where it's not equal to zero, okay? Um, then I claim this is sort of the typical thing you would get. Why? Because we're imagining that Let's think, before electroweak symmetry breaking, every particle in the standard model is massless. It's not a bad approximation to the, to the, the demigods up at high energy, right? So for them, if you do separation of variables, phi equals e to the i, p mu, x mu, um, psi, and some extra dimensional wave function, this p squared is approximately zero. For the standard model, it's piddling. These masses are really tiny. You throw that away. So you see that the typical solution here to this equals zero is an exponential, as long as you have some mass. You can actually have mass in higher dimensions and still look like a massless particle, as long as your wave function does interesting things. In particular, if it has sort of exponential behavior, except at special sources, at special points where it doesn't solve the homogeneous equation, and those are these special points here, okay? So, exponential behavior is kind of the norm, and uh, what kind of physics would come out of a picture like that, okay? So, um, let me go over here. So what we'd love to know is you take three particles in the standard model, species i, j, k. You'd like to know what is this coupling g, i, j, k in the most generic sense possible. You're a gambler, okay? Well, you would guess, gosh, in higher dimensions, maybe it's everybody is talking to everybody about as much as, as, as democratically as possible. But if I look at only these least wiggly modes, or the ones that survive to low energies, the one for which this analysis is true, then I would get some sort of a wave function overlap in the extra dimensions, sorry, some wave function overlap in the extra dimensions for species i, species j, and species k, the lowest lying modes, the particles, the modes that, the, the wave functions corresponding to the standard model modes. And there'd be some sort of overlap like this, okay? You can already see that with a lot of exponentials floating around, you could easily pick up some sort of hierarchical structure. In fact, let's go further and let's do the Yukawa couplings where one of the species in this trilinear thing is the Higgs boson. In that case, you would guess you'd get some sort of of course, it's only sort of order of magnitude. You'd expect some 
order one modulation of this because we do not know the um, sort of what's happening totally in the extra dimensional sense. But this would be the way you'd gamble. And here, that would come out to look like this. Um, integrating over the x dimensions, you'd have psi i, psi j, and psi higgs. Okay. Now, what happens? You can try different things. You can say, with exponentials, exponentials are very finicky. It's like in doing wave function overlaps with exponentials, the most peaked wave function often is where the integral dominates. Okay, just play around with exponentials yourself. Whoever is most dominant, who, whoever has sort of got the, 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 the sharpest peak tends to dominate where this integral is. If, if psi h is the most peaked, in other words, you're throwing random numbers in some ballpark for this higher dimensional mass parameter, that determines the exponential that you get here, okay? E to the, e to the minus m r extra dimension. So even small differences in mass give sort of wildly different amounts of peaking. And so typically somebody dominates. If it's the Higgs that's the most peaked, then this thing becomes order one ij and psi i evaluated at the Higgs peak, psi j evaluated at the Higgs peak. Okay, that's a, this guy wins and this whole thing just turns into something that's roughly like this. And you're gonna get small, small numbers. These, these things are gonna be, you're gonna be picking out the exponential tail at the Higgs peak of some other wave function. So, but this is exactly of the form that's in the data, okay? That this is reproducing that kind of ansatz that's in the data. Now, you might say, gosh, that's an interesting tale, and there's probably a thousand other ways I could have told this just so story of how we get this structure in the standard model. But I'm asserting to you that this is one that there are other ways to do it. And in a sense, they all have a little bit of this kind of flavor, even if they're more algebraic than this sort of wave function overlap story. There is some sort of an isomorphism between them, not some sort, we know a set of tricks that morph one way of doing flavor into others. And, um, and so this is one that resonates, uh, it keeps coming up, and is a useful way in the back of your head if you want some picture of what flavor looks like uh, or where it came from to think in terms of this. Um, if you look at that paper, you'll see, you know, well, what happened with the leptons? Did I have to invent a new rule for that? And the sense in which um, that's not true uh, that there's some coherent picture of quarks and leptons. You can take a look at that paper. Roughly, it's just to contemplate that other, other of these particles could be the most concentrated. Okay, so, but I'll let you read that for yourself. This is a crude cartoon of um, where flavor physics might have emerged from. Um, and indeed, you can, still, you can also ask, why didn't the same thing happen with gauge bosons? Why weren't gauge bosons like here's the photon. Why isn't it got a wave function like this? And indeed, if, electro if, if gauge fields in the standard model emerge from higher dimensional gauge fields, higher dimensional gauge fields would not have a mass by gauge invariance, and they would have a much flatter looking profile, okay? So you can play around with this kind of structure, and you can see that it's not a crazy thing for the standard model gauge, gauge couplings to be relatively order one and democratic and have a very hierarchical structure in Yukawa couplings. Um, the one line thing that follows from this that matters for new physics is simply that new physics could well be just, just like this. This is the sort of going rate gamble. 
in which case its couplings to everybody else is not likely to be order one, okay, just damn it, everything is order one with some random flavor structure, but, but rather it's likely to be hierarchical. In other words, this theme of hierarchy in the standard model is, is a very good, is a very good um, indicator that even new physics coupled to the standard model can easily and likely be hierarchical in its couplings to um, the standard model fermions. And so we should take that as a kind of reasonable uh, given. Um, so there are some options for trying to evade the flavor tests and continue to believe in new physics at accessible energies. Um, one is to ask what kinds of hierarchical couplings are consistent in a kind of dumb way without being too clever with flavor tests. What kinds of physics with this broad picture in mind are consistent with flavor tests, which are extremely stringent. Another possibility is if you're introducing new physics, don't couple to the standard model fermions. That, that's not completely guaranteeing your safety, but it's, it's certainly in one fell swoop reducing the degree of danger by a number of orders of magnitude. Okay, so that's always good advice. Just don't couple the standard model fermions, Just couple to anything else, any other part of the standard model, the Higgs, the gauge bosons. Or you have another option. Introduce more structure to say that the standard model couplings are, the couplings to the standard model of your new physics has some protective agency, some, something you can understand that really tightly controls flavor violation so that you don't run afoul of all of the flavor uh, tests that we already have. Um, a classic possibility that I won't talk about in supersymmetry, for example, is gauge-mediated supersymmetry breaking. Um, again, I put in the reading list this review by Mike Dine in the TASI lectures, and uh, very beautiful idea, comes with a lot of structure to explain why the couplings that could have been very flavor violating by any normal consideration, because of something playing out in the ultraviolet, are coming out in a very sort of flavor blind way. Okay. But these are the different options. Um, so what I wanted to do next was, however, to take the bull by its horns, not try to hide and say, I'm not coupling to fermions, I'm, I'm, I, or I'm coupling to fermions in a totally flavor blind way of some sort, but in, to a, in fact ask what kind of possibilities allow you to have new physics, accessible energies, and be safe from flavor in a dumb way, and yet couple to flavor in a very interesting way, okay? Um, so that's what I want to do next, except I kind of memorized my deadline, which is expired, um, based on when I would have started, but I forgot when I started. Scott, do you know what my nominal deadline is? <laughs> Look. That's good to me. I, I, I'm, I'm willing to stop. I'm, I'm willing to stop whenever you want me to stop. I mean, for example, I could pause now. That is, I'm set up the suspense. <laughs> flavor is deadly. Best thing to do: don't talk to the flavor of fermions. Just leave them alone. Just couple to something else. Um, are there exceptions? Is there a way of thinking through that a little bit? That's what's coming next. I want to propose an example, and I want to show a kind of case study of, at least sketch it out, of how that consideration of flavor allows you to attack anomalies as they occur at high energy colliders, where somebody says, look, there's a rumor of blah, 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 and then you're trying to figure out, well, what Feynman diagram should I draw that does that, and then flavor comes and you start panicking. I want to give you a way of thinking about it, okay? So that's where I was headed. I'm happy to do whatever I'm told. I'm, I'm, I can start that or, or stop. Very good.